Hello, everyone, and welcome to Facebook Live with the Horticulturists. We are the Horticulturists here to answer your gardening questions. And today we are chatting all about kind of seed starting and garden planning and getting started for the season. My name is Candace Hart. I'm the State Master Gardener um, Specialist here for U of I Extension, and I'm based here in Bloomington, which is a snowy snow globe right now. So great day to be talking about gardening. Um, but I also have uh, some of my fellow horticulturists with us today. Um, Ryan just popped in. He's been having some computer issues, but we so we'll get to him. But we also have um, Chris with us today, who's our guest. So Chris, do you want to introduce yourself? Tell folks kind of what your areas of expertise are. Certainly. Well, thank you for having me today, Candace. I am excited to be with you on this snow globe day yeah. uh, here where I'm at in Macomb. Same story. Uh, woke up to a gray, dreary day, and now it is uh, bright white outside. Um, mm -hmm. So good for lighting for me, I guess. But uh, sure. my name is Chris Enroth, and I am a horticulture educator with U of I Extension. I'm based in Macomb. I'd say my background is, for the most part, deals with landscaping, uh, trees and shrubs, um, and, you know, landscape architecture and some design work too. So, uh, but I love me some vegetables. So uh, <laughs> that's, that is kind of my home passion. Awesome. And I did mention, I, like, like I've said before, I'm a flower lady. I love to chat about anything flower related. So the, that's kind of my area of, of gardening expertise, but I think we've got Ryan with us, but I think his, his camera is still having issues. Ryan, are you, can you hear us? 
Nope, maybe not. He might still be having still, still, uh, technical, Walter, yeah. technical difficulties. So we'll come back to we'll come back to Ryan. But Ryan is also a horticulture educator and he's based in the kind of champagne area. And like Chris, also loves to chat about vegetables. So we're definitely gonna have a good focus on that today. So if you guys have questions, go ahead and start adding those into the chat box and we will take those as we go through um, today. And I see there's already one in the queue. So that is awesome. So let's start first, I think, Chris, let's just kind of chat about what we do as kind of gardeners this time of year and how we kind of get geared up for uh, seed starting and kind of getting ready. So do you want to kind of share what you're up to first? Certainly, yes. And I'll, I'll share some pictures here. But before I do that, I just, I'll say kind of my initial thing is, is days like today, you get seed catalogs out. Um, mm-hmm. I've also call up some people and be like, hey, what'd you grow last year? What worked <laughs> really well? And then I spend way too much money ordering seeds. <laughs> and uh, actually, I just got my seed order. We went to uh, Florida about a week and a half ago got back. All my seeds were here. I am super excited to uh, get things started. But I, let me show some pictures too, Candace, of kind of how I roll in terms of seed starting. So uh, in the, uh, in the beginning, there was a shelf that was (laughs) repurposed into a seed starting rack or play, uh, you know, somewhere where I could put my flats. Mm-hmm. Um, you can see here, this is kind of when I first started, it's much more messier today. Uh, so I, I wouldn't dare show <laughs> what it looks like right now. There's all kinds of house plants and things. Um, so you'll see a little preview of that, but, um, it, this is just a repurposed shelf. Candace, do you, you do something similar at home? Yeah. Same thing. I have one of the same kind of metal rack that's tall and has multiple shelves that you can move around and mine's on wheels. So I can kind of move it around, but yeah, same idea. Yeah, I didn't have all the pieces and parts to this, hence the two by fours holding up some of the shelves, <laughs> but still works. Uh, works. I, I attached my, uh, there's a grow light uh, attached here and it's a four tube fluorescent system. Um, so there's four fluorescent bulbs, the big, long, skinny kind. Um, I believe they're just regular types of grow fluorescent bulbs. You can get more specialized ones and even higher intensity ones like T5s and stuff like that, but I I did not have the money for that when I first bought this uh, setup here. And yeah, let's let's chat about bulbs a little bit while you're mm-hmm. while you're at it because I know that's a definitely a common question that we get asked a lot. It's like, what kind of bulbs do I do I need? And I'm with you. I do the same thing where I just use regular. I think they're cool whites, fluorescent, yep. the cheap ones you get at the home store um, for the purpose of of seed starting. Because if you want to get kind of into technical, you've got wavelengths of light that plants are going to use. And those fluorescent bulbs are good for that wavelength for green growth. So for seed starting, house plants, stuff like that, I find them to be perfectly sufficient for that. Have you found kind of the same? I found the exact same thing. Um, They work really well for seed starting. They are not as pricey as some of the other bulbs. Um, you do have to handle something like a T5 bulb a little bit differently. Got to make sure that you wear gloves when you, if you are handling those types of tubes, because if you have oil on your hands, that mm. oil on the bulb can damage that uh, fixture. So yeah. um, I know there are some gardeners who are pretty competitive in the seed starting stuff, and they will actually swap out their bulbs every season. I don't do that. Do you do that, Candace? No. Well, if they're still working, I'm using them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Same here. Same here. <laughs> so, um, but I have started exploring the world of different lighting fixtures. Um, but just here is actually this next image here. This is actually, I'm over-entering some coleus now. And so here's just a quick nice. glimpse of what it's like right now under my seed starting rack, which is also now my overwintering plant rack. Um, My coleus is starting to bloom, and that's just with that fluorescent fixture right there. Um, It provides really good light. It does really good work for house plants and things like that, but that only does one shelf. I needed something for the top shelf, and so I have started looking at LEDs. Um, Mm -hmm. So this is a bit of an older fixture that I'm using. It's one of those that has like the blue and the red wavelengths of light. Mm -hmm. with the idea kind of what you mentioned already uh, having the vegetative growth versus like maybe a more of a triggering for a bloom uh, type wavelength. I usually have them both on 
<laughs> yeah. I just want to give as much light to the plants as possible. Yeah. Um, and I'm I'm not too. This is this is does fine for you know a very maybe a single flat, but it is not enough usually for my shelf that I have. Um, so I spent a little bit more money on a full spectrum LED grow light. Um, cool. I really like this one. I'm seeing a really good growth response, at least with the plants that I've had under this one. Um, so as you can see, full spectrum, it's white light, um, and it's very thin. That's like oh amazing. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't know enough about LEDs necessarily to be answering certain questions out there, especially uh, like what you know wavelengths are this is this emitting and things like that. I I don't know enough about that, but. I am really liking the full spectrum LED lights as opposed to the blue red ones, at least for my purposes. Nice. Yeah, I have not experimented yet with those, but that looks that looks really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It with both LED fixtures I have, you can actually chain them together with identical fixtures. And so I could actually add more onto the system if I wanted to. Oh, cool. Um, I just haven't gotten that far yet because they can be a little expensive. Oh yeah. Uh, some of the nicer ones. Yeah. But hopefully you'll get at least a couple of years use out of them, right? At least. Definitely. Think. Yeah. Definitely. And I and I would don't want folks to think that LEDs are going to be something that lasts forever too, because they, yeah. they don't. They wear out just like a fluorescent tube would wear out too. And so um, yeah. they do have a lifespan on them. Cool. Very cool. Okay. Awesome. How about um Temperature. I mean, that's that's one thing to consider with some um, lights too. That some lights can put off some warmth too, which you don't necessarily want. But that's what's also nice about LEDs and the fluorescents is that they tend to be um, pretty cool. They don't put off a lot of temperatures. But of course, seeds, different seeds are going to need different temperatures in order, soil temperatures in order to germinate. So, do you do you need to do anything in your setup for temperature? Well, if you haven't guessed it yet, I am doing this in the basement. And so our yeah. basement runs a little bit cooler than most. And so this next image, I don't think you can see it, but here are some flats that we have on our seed starting rack. You can see a little bit of germination occurring, but underneath these flats is a heat mat. Um, and so that heat mat helps to maintain a nice temperature so that we get good germination. Um, and the key thing though, once, so at this point, when I start seeing seeds pop like this, I know it's time to take them off the heat mat or unplug the heat mat because there can be a point if you're applying too much bottom heat, you could actually damage plant roots. And so we don't want to do that. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. I have a couple of those uh, same two that I'll put on certain things that I know kind of need that warmer, <laughs> warmer temperature a little bit. I said, I have my setup in my um, garage because I don't have a basement. And what's nice about my garage is I do have a heater out there. So Usually what I'll do is I'll kind of crank the crank the heat up out there during the times when I'm getting seed started. And I will actually sometimes put it in a location where uh, the, the air movement from that heater is actually kind of hitting those plants um, also. Because that's something to think about too is some seed starters will put a fan on their uh, seedlings, one, to kind of keep just air moving in general, but it's also tends to help you create kind of a stockier, tougher seedling, right? Yeah. Do you do it? Do you have to do any of that with your setup? I do. I actually, so my lights are on a 16-hour timer. And so I would recommend before you even start putting seeds in flats, make sure that you have your lighting fixtures set up because what we see right here, this is actually, I seeded these flats and then three days later, they started popping. If I wasn't ready with my light fixture at that time, they would start getting stretchy. Um, yeah. So that timer, not only does it control my lights, it controls an oscillating fan that moves air Perfect. over top of them. Because, I'll let me show this next picture. When we start seeds inside, I think they're weak. Uh, they need strength. Um, yeah. They need a little bit of little bit of stress to build up their uh, tolerance to what life will be like in the out great outdoors. And so uh, pictured here is actually a, uh, from a few years ago, starting seeds in my office. These are tomato seedlings. Now, may, I mean, the main thing I can see right here, there's not enough light. There's a window yeah. nearby. That's the only light source they have. You can see that they're stretched. They're, mm -hmm. There's not enough light, so they're weak and spindly. But also like a little bit of wind 
can help build up a little bit of strength, It'll build up a little bit more of a waxy leaf surface for it because we're going to have to harden these off eventually uh, mm -hmm. so they can go outside. Yeah, good point. Oh, and we've got Ryan. Welcome, hey. Ryan. <laughs> Hi, Ryan. Hey, glad, glad to make it. Sorry about the technical difficulties there. I, I'm not a computer person. I'm a plant person. <laughs> <laughs> all good. Do you want to introduce yourself uh, quick, Ryan? Uh, sure. If you if you all haven't tuned in to the show, I'm Ryan Pankow, horticulture educator out of Champaign County. And, um, you know, my specialty is uh, trees and woody plants, but um, like, like both Chris and Candace, I like to grow veggies too. So... Um, Kind of a, always kind of been a side hobby since I've had a space for a garden. I've always kind of grown veggies. So, um, awesome. but yeah. Cool. Well, glad, glad we got you. <laughs> One of those days. Cool. Well, I, we've had a couple of questions, Chris. Uh, do you have more photos or is that your last one? I got a couple more uh, to okay. share, but we can, we can cool. wait or we can keep going. Yeah, let me do at least one of these because it, it's regarded to kind of something you were showing. Um, someone on the YouTube asked, um, how much is the lowest cost for that one and can it be used outside? I think they were probably referring to that last LED um, light you were showing. Do you have kind of a rough price range maybe for something like that? Um, I am getting in farther and farther into this lighting game and, um, the price tag goes up and up. You can yeah. get a commercial LED light fixture that they use to grow the, the mums and the poinsettias and all the things that we buy at a greenhouse for 10,000, tens of thousands of dollars. I mean, mm -hmm. they can be very expensive. Homeowner market's a little bit different. Um, and you, I think you do have to be a little bit careful. Um, cause, uh, I feel like the quality just might not be there for some of the sh like lower priced fixtures, but there are some that if you just need a little bit extra light, you know, you're at a window setting like this, maybe that's all you need. Like one of those where you can just stick on the pot and they're a little bendable and they can direct light. Um, that's just to supplement, um, a little bit more light. Uh, yeah. the fixtures that I'm looking at these days are costing 200 plus dollars. Um, so they're pricey. Yeah. 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 Well, add up so if you need multiples of them, yeah. Yes. Yeah, and they ask, can it be used outside? I would say probably not. You would not want it to get wet, right? Definitely not, yeah. So yes. uh, with the LED fixtures are actually hung up on the ceiling, down on top of the rack. Um, the fluorescent fixture to protect that, I actually had a extra, well, maybe I'll just, uh, no, I have an extra shelf there where I have a, a plastic film to protect any possibility of water coming down, leaking down that, because I don't want any type of electrical issues. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Okay. Awesome. And then let's see, Tim had a comment. He said the purple uh, will save a little bit of energy on big commercial applications, but the color is nauseating, not worth it to us. So yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it hurts your, it can give you a headache even when you walk into those big greenhouses and you, yeah. if you're doing a lot of work for maybe a day, people get headaches. They do have special sunglasses you can wear to kind of filter out some of that wavelength issues, but I don't think it I don't think it helps that much, but yeah, so oh, it can be rough. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, good comment. Okay, I think we've got one other question that's come in that is soil related, which we'll definitely get to in regards to uh, seed starting. But let's go ahead and chat about um, Eileen's question here. She said, um, last year was my first planting in a new bed. I cleaned up and started a cover crop. What do I need to be concerned about when I start planting in terms of soil? Either of you want to kind of touch on that for her? Well, so with, a, she said she planted a cro cover crop. Is that? Yeah. So new bed, uh, cleaned it up and then started a cover crop. Yeah. So, you know, it, it depends on the cover crop, how you kind of manage that in the spring. So that's, mm -hmm. that kind of plays into the question too, but, um, you know, I guess a lot of times I have, uh, I've actually ended my cover crop with, you know, some, some die over the winter, some you have to actually terminate in the spring. So, you know, everything from a string trimmer to a tiller I've used to terminate that cover crop. So that, and that kind of depends on what kind of soil surface I'm planting into where, um, you know, if I was, or I guess what I'm planting into the soil surface, where if I was seeding a succession planting of lettuce, you know, with all those tiny seeds, I kind of like to have a really prepared surface where if I'm coming in with seedlings later, I'm not as worried about, you know, my soil surface. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Would you guys have other thoughts to add? I've done something similar with the winter kill cover crop. Um, 
where we had the winter for the most part killed everything. We did have to do a little bit of um, like hand pulling for some stragglers that survived. It was a mild winter that we had that year. And we used it as a mulch for suppression because we were not seeding. We were transplanting in sweet potato slips. And so we didn't have to have a nice prepared seed bed for that. We were transplanting a living plant. And so we could leave that mulch layer there. But if you have seed, like Brian said, you have to have a bed that's prepared and you don't want to bury it in mulch because then you might get germination issues. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Yeah, definitely. Great. Awesome. Well, hopefully that will help you out. Um, okay, let's take one more question. Keep those questions coming, guys. You can add them in the chat box and then we'll keep talking about kind of our seed certain setup. But Darren had a question. Um, how toxic are walnut trees to tomato plants? I have some near my garden and the tomatoes never perform well. Well, I think we've all probably ran into this question or had ex mm -hmm. different experiences with it where um, I've been really surprised in some cases at gardens that I've seen that are really close to a walnut tree, to be frank. To be frank. And then I've also seen and I've had a situation arise where some fruit trees died that were a good 50 yards away from the nearest walnut tree. And that was about the only thing we could attribute to their, their just death from something that seemed toxic. So I think it varies, but um, it's safe to say that for a mature tree, if, if it has an unimpeded root zone, the spread of those roots is, you know, usually estimated to be two to three times the width of the canopy. So, um, you know, that's quite a bit of distance of separation that would be recommended from a walnut. Um, and then, of course, it just it depends on how many roots are interacting with the soil that your tomato plants are in as to how much toxicity your plants would get. But tomatoes are pretty sensitive, in my experience. What, what have you guys experienced with tomato sensitivity? I don't have much personal experience, but I've, I know I've read many, many, many sources that that whole family, that Solanaceous family, is, is definitely susceptible to that juggalone. Yeah, and where I've yep. seen tomatoes suffering, it's it's not like they just die tomorrow. You, you know, yeah. they, they just don't ever really grow well. They just kind of struggle. They're stunted and just, you know, so, so yeah. those are the cases where, and, 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 you know, I don't know how you actually for certain say like it's walnut, you know, toxicity right. that's caused this, like juglone is a chemical. I don't know if they can mm -hmm. test for that in the soil, but it's always been kind of a process of elimination of other things that we've ever concluded, hey, it might be that walnut next to your garden. And I also wonder um, how many times in the past it could, walnut could have been involved in an issue and just the client never told us that there was a walnut tree close. True. Because you don't think to look for that, or maybe they yeah. can't identify a walnut tree very easily. So yeah. No. What, a, what about a raised bed? If you brought in new soil and filled a raised bed, do you think that would be enough to enough of a separation? It would help for a while. I think if walnut roots could get in there, that would be an issue. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, one thing that just is, is kind of a general treatment for issues with tree roots is, you know, trenching and cutting off those roots. You know, that's that, of course, you know, as a short term fix, you'd have to do it repeatedly. But if you combine trenching with um, there's actually pretty good, easy to install materials that are root barriers, kind of like a flimsy plastic sheet you would insert into that um, trench after you set it. You probably mm -hmm. could restrict walnut root growth pretty well with that. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. Do you do you guys have other methods of trying to bear, block off those roots other than cutting the tree down? You know, that's usually last resort for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, we've had just a absolute bumper crop of black walnuts seedlings popping up in our backyard. We have quite a few trees in the woods behind us that are, I'd say, composition-wise, 30% black walnut. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would definitely say competition is the main issue when it comes to trees throwing shade, roots competing for soil resources, um, and then us wanting to have a full sun garden. Um, that's that's the main thing I've encountered, at least. I know that there have been like lab studies showing the effects of jug loan on solanaceous crops. Uh, it's really harder to replicate stuff like that out in a field setting. Um, so the, again, it, it's kind of up in the air. Um, the, I, you know, I would look more towards having to minimize that competition is what Ryan says. If you can eliminate some of that root competition, give those plants more light, better airflow, you're probably going to be uh, better off and using some type of a root barrier, raised bed, you know, that, that can be another 
avenue to, to assist with that. But I've, I've grown raised beds next to a maple tree. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> they get in there no matter what. And yeah. I'm digging up carrots and maple tree roots. And so, ooh, that, yeah. that I don't grow root crops in that bed anymore. <laughs> Good thinking. Awesome. Well, Darren said thank you. He said the odd, the odd thing is that they look uh, bountiful and beautiful until they fruit, then they wither and struggle. And he said all of the crops look good. It's the only thing they can attribute it to. So it's quite possible. Awesome. Okay, keep those questions coming. I see a couple others, but let's keep looking at your kind of seed start and set up here, Chris, if you want to keep kind of showing your pictures there, and then we'll Certainly. take more questions. So we left off here. These are some tomato seedlings. Obviously, they need more light. Um, the, they, they need more light, um, and the window just doesn't cut it. You know, we think, oh, it's a bright, sunny window, but, but really, it, it's just not going to work. And so that's when we usually bring in some type of supplemental lighting to help assist with that. Um, and so uh, below that shelf actually was, was this a set of flats, and this has the uh, fluorescent tube lighting here. Um, this was actually, I think, for a Master Gardener plant sale. We have a couple things where I think we actually grew some rhubarb from seed. Um, we have some Cosmos, uh, so a bachelor's button, it looks like. So there's a lot of different flowering plants here for a plant sale. Um, and things look a little bit better, the little bit darker green. Um, but you can tell when I switch to this next picture that that fixture doesn't cover the entire flat. And so everything on the edges of the flat are leaning inward and that creates more competition, more competing space for those that light resources. And it takes energy from that plant to grow in that fashion. And so it, I, in a perfect world, we would have a light fixture that casts light down from one edge of the flat to the other edge of the flat. Mm -hmm. But you can go to like a nursery and you can see cell packs and you can tell how that light competition works out as the plants grow and, and get more mature. The ones in the middle of that pack usually are taller, a bit more spindly. The ones at the edge, usually a bit more stouter. And mm -hmm. so that's what is happening here. It's just the beginning of that. Very cool. So we could totally forget about supplemental lighting and try to grow outside. Uh, start our seeds outside. So this is actually in our high tunnel that we have at the Macomb Extension office. And we have lots of different cool season crops because it's pretty chilly out, probably a little too chilly for tomatoes and such. But um, here we have some arugula, pak choy, romaine, uh, salanova lettuce, cabbages, lots of different cool season crops that we're able to start in a protected space like a high tunnel uh, here. And, you know, even things like kale. Um, and then uh, we do some onions, and then as we get farther through the season, this isn't this year yet, but this was a few years ago, we get our tomatoes. And these tomatoes look beautiful. They started yeah. outside in the high tunnel. Good stat or a structure to those tomatoes, good color. And so that's really what we want to see. And that's kind of difficult to achieve inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wouldn't it be a perfect world if we all had our own little greenhouse or high tunnel? I, we could start it's on my list, life yeah. list. I saw a, tick, a TikTok the other day. It was showing this beautiful greenhouse you could buy at Costco. And I was like, oh, man, that looks... <laughs> if I had a good spot for it, that would be awesome. <laughs> so, Chris, I'm just curious. What's your, uh, what's your timing on starting seeds then in a high tunnel? When do those tomatoes start about? So, these tomatoes probably started in mid-March for us. Um, again, we're starting them outside. So, we have to make sure they're protected. And also with with the knowledge that I'm watching the weather very closely. Um, thinking about high tunnels and how they work, there's no supplemental heat here. It's all heated by the sun. And so very often your temperature inside the high tunnel will be the same temperature as it is outside at about dawn. You know, eventually that high temperature, mm -hmm. that heat is lost at nighttime and things equalize by about beginning of the morning. And so if it's going to be like below 40, like really 45 or below, I'm taking these things inside. Um, so I am monitoring temperature very closely, um, but they are, these tomatoes, they got planted in that high tunnel. So kind of the nice thing is they got started there and that's where they got to, uh, get planted, harvest, and that's where they finished out. So, um, but yeah, you got to keep an eye on that temperature for the cool season crops. You know, I, you could, you could seed those flats indoors, like right now. And then once all this darn snow melts, we could probably get out to the high tunnel and, and throw those in there and you'll start to get germination, uh, especially if we get a sunny, warm couple of string of those 
uh, mm -hmm. they'll be warm enough to uh, get some germination happening there. Nice. Love it. Christine commented the same. She said, high tunnel and greenhouse are true dreams for me too. Yeah, we're with you. <laughs> we're with you. Cool. Okay, well, we've got some questions that have come in. So let's take a look. Keep those questions coming, guys. Um, let's see. Another question from uh, Christine. Actually, I'm going to go up to Kathy's question. Um, any tips for growing sweet potatoes in grow bags? You guys ever done that? I have. <laughs> um, grow bags, it's like clay pots, but even more so. They dry out so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so clay, or sorry, grow bags is a fabric, at least in my experience. Uh, many different brands out there, but it's like a felt fabric. Um, and if I had a dedicated drip irrigation system, the sweet potatoes probably would have done better. Um, I would recommend if you do use grow bags, um, use some type of supplemental mulch, could be wood chips, straw, shredded leaves, whatever it is, something to help insulate that bag, um, keep the soil from drying out too quickly. Um, but we've, we grew in fabric pots, we grew in fa or plastic pots, and I grew in hanging baskets. The hanging mm. baskets, that was actually pretty interesting. interesting. Um, we got like, I called them fingerling sweet potatoes. They weren't the big honking <laughs> monsters you get in the ground. But they were like fingerlings. They cook just as good as a regular sweet potato. That was good, yeah. yeah. That'd be a pretty, pretty hanging basket too, because the foliage is nice yes. on that, obviously. Exactly. Yep. That was kind of like, can we have a pretty hanging basket and a tasty yeah. chicken at the end of the season? Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Cool. Okay. Well, hopefully that helps you out, Kathy. Definitely give it a try and let us know how it goes. Um, okay, let's see. Question from Christine. When growing seedlings, uh, and if they get leggy, what can you do? First year planting flower seeds, and I didn't expect zinnias to pop up in two days, and now they're leggy. Yep, they definitely do. Uh, what do I do now? I took them off the heat mat and have them under a cheaper LED light and have a fan going. These are in a spare room in my home. Um, yeah, any tips, guys? I can speak in specifically for zinnias. I was before our call, I was just going through my seed packets and kind of getting organized into what I need to start four weeks and six weeks and eight weeks. And one of those that I'm not going to start until probably April uh, are those zinnias. So and I'll let you guys chime in too. But unfortunately, Christine, there's not a ton to do at this point. Honestly, it's it's so early. You're going to have to keep those Welcome growing the, until we're after that frost-free date, which is going to be in May. So I hate to say it, but you may actually be better off to start again um, and wait uh, a little bit longer because, yeah, zinnias just pop up so quick. And I have actually found them to be more productive and easier if they're almost even direct seeded too and they're planted directly out in the garden. But do you guys have any tips? Like if something does get leggy, what, any tips for, for that? Well, I mean, I think like adding a fan and, and concentrated lights about the best, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. best you can do. Yeah. Yeah. Certain plants and tomatoes are the only ones that really come to mind. Um, if they get leggy, you can bury their stem a little bit deeper. If you can mm. pot those up into a larger pot, um, and so that that helps, but I've been there. I have had all of kind of a mess of tomato seedlings, and I start untangling them, and all of a sudden I'm breaking stems, and I'm doing all kinds of stuff. And yeah, I, Candace, it just might be better to um, call, just try again later on. In the yeah, season. yeah, yeah. It hurts when you've already gone through all the effort to do that, but it, in in terms of like the, having the most productive plants later on. I think you'll be better off if you kind of start fresh. Yeah. And I'm sure the idea of starting indoors was to get a, a head start for larger oh, yeah. plants when you plant out there. But gosh, yeah. I've, I've had just super good luck. And I'm sure you guys have just direct seeding zinnias. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's kind of like a backup for us in spots where there's just nothing. It's like, yeah. you know, about mid May or so or late May, it's like, well, where do we have an open spot? Let's put some zinnias in, you know? And right. They always do great. So, yeah. Awesome. Cool. Hopefully that helps Christine. Um, let's see. Mavis asked, my cucumbers have died uh, in the last two years. I have raised beds. They start out beautiful. Then with heavy rains, they croak. Any thoughts on that? 
Hmm. My vegetable experts. <laughs> so scouting around, um, there, you might find certain insects that might go after cucumber plants, one of those being the cucumber beetle, um, and they can carry a disease called bacterial wilt um, that can very quickly affect your cucumbers. And um, it is a serious pest because we know that the threshold for treatment is one. You see one and the, that's the threshold. There's like, you got to spray something because it could transmit bacterial wilt. Your cucumber gets that, it croaks. Um, so that is one possibility. So scouting out in the garden when you have your cucumbers out there, um, you see uh, the cucumber beetle, which is like a yellow, dark, black striped uh, a beetle, I think also could be spotted. Um, you know, take a picture, send it to your local extension office and get it identified. Um, and, you know, we can give some pesticide recommendations if you want to go that route. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really try to kind of take a, if these do see that happen and do a really close investigation. If this does happen to you again, maybe and see if you can get some more info. Yeah, I'd say that's probably the worst pest I've dealt with in cucumbers. I mean, one strategy is to, for a time period at the start of the season, you can exclude them mm -hmm. with a floating row cover. But, you know, at some point you've got to pull that off and let pollination happen. So that's what mm -hmm. I've kind of done is it's like co cover them up at the start of the year as much as I can stand. And then as soon as I open it up, just race to get some cucumbers before the beetles. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I've, I've tried to not use pesticides, but um, I, that's one that, gosh, it's just really hard to manage without some type mm -hmm. of control, you know, pesticide yeah. or what, yeah, something that can yeah. control it. But. That's a hard one. Okay, let's see. Robin asks, have you tried the milk jug winter sewing? If so, any pros and cons? Yeah. Not me. Not me, but it looks cool. Have you tried it, Chris? I know. I have um, not tried, Chris. Um, so that is actually a master gardener naturalist activity that we have done with kids. We actually, we don't do veggies, we do milkweed. Um, so we get milk jugs, water bottles, whatever people will donate to us. And we cut the top off, put some potting mix in there. We put in some milkweed seed, tape it back on, just have them set them out in the yard um, with a little bit of water in there, of course. And yeah, you can germinate milkweed that way if you get them, a, you know, exposed to that cold freezing thaw uh, cycle. Um, in terms of vegetables, uh, actually, my neighbor down the street, she does it like this. Uh, she starts in milk jugs because she doesn't have a seed starting rack at home. She does this all outside under her deck, uh, under some plastic, and it works really well. The big thing to keep in mind is it is a small container, a small vessel, which means it heats up quick, cools off quick. And so it can get really hot in there on a sunny, cold day. It can also cool off very quickly um, if wind temperatures drop below freezing and the sun goes away. Nice. That's a good point. Yeah, you have to manage it pretty pretty closely. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Cool. Very cool. Yeah, I have not tried that yet. I've been I was going to try it with milkweed and I haven't I haven't done it yet because I've seen others do that. Yeah. Okay, let's see. I know we've got some other questions. Um, Karen asks, are there ways to warm up the soil to plant spring crops any earlier? Um, well, there's the good old black plastic kind of yeah. cover. You know, I've yeah, done that that's before. What I was thinking. Um, yeah. And I think that was kind of an accidental thing where I was just trying to exclude weeds or kill weeds in a bed and then, you know, peeled it back earlier in spring and it was... It was warm, and I think probably also just had some some rain, uh, you know, blocked the rain, so there wasn't as much moisture in there, and I could, you know, till the soil or work the soil or plant things. Yeah, so it's something very similar. You could do uh, just like a – just cover it with like a black plastic. Mm -hmm. Could even do a clear plastic. Um, uh, or you could build low tunnels, um, which are just essentially – it could be PVC or metal conduit pipe that's bent – and you just put plastic then over top of that, uh, kind of like with the milk jug thing, you're just increasing that airspace, which takes more time to heat up, but it holds that heat longer. And so maybe can hold the soil a little bit uh, warmer. Uh, and then also raised beds tend to warm up faster than in ground uh, soil, but it, it takes management too, in terms of soil temperatures. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen some pretty neat little low tunnel structures that just can kind of move around real easy. Mm -hmm. But I just always, I've never built one, but I've always thought that that would be 
neat to have kind of the portable one you can move around and get out of the way or um, I've, I've done it kind of in the past in a really low tech way with just raised beds that had um, I just bent PVC, mm-hmm. you know, over it. And then yeah. what I liked about that was I would just kind of throw plastic over it very sloppily and hold the sides down. But then I could also put that floating row cover over it as an exclusion. Yeah too, you know, so it allowed me to, you know, it was warming up. I could peel it off. I could still keep insects out for a while. So I don't know, low, low tunnels are pretty low tech, pretty cheapo, easy way to kind of start kind of having a high tunnel type situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's my go-to too. It's just PVC from edge to edge on the raised beds and cover them up. Yeah. Awesome. Well, hopefully that helps. Great questions, everybody. Keep those coming. We've got some more um, Ken asks, is there a good reference document or source of info on how to use an inexpensive greenhouse? He said they put together a 10 by 12 greenhouse last summer, but nervous about using it right. And they're specifically for starting transplants. Any resource recommendations, you guys? Um, I did do a webinar. Um, it is on the Illinois Horticulture YouTube channel. It is It re- talks about season extension. It covers things. It doesn't talk about greenhouse. Um, it focuses mostly on high tunnels, low tunnels, the milk jugs or cloches, uh, cold frames. Um, and so it, it focuses on that. I think there are some resources there at the end of that presentation if, if folks wanted to check that out. Uh, the, it, the big difference, though, and I'll make sure to throw this out there, high tunnels versus a greenhouse and why do we distinguish these two? Greenhouses have some type of supplemental heat source. High tunnel, the only heat source typically that comes from the sun. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Great. Yeah, we'll see if we can get the, the link uh, for that recording in the chat box. Yeah, for me, the biggest thing in a greenhouse is uh, managing the vents, managing the temperatures, and, and being able to open and close those vents when when needed. So it's really just a lot about monitoring Um what you can out there for the most part. Yep. Yeah. It can get hot in there in the winter too. So don't, oh, yeah. don't think it's going to be cold in the winter. I've in yeah. our high tunnel on a 30 degree day, full sun, it can get up to 80 degrees in there. Nice. Yeah. And, and it's, it's definitely one of those, like you can't just set it and forget it kind of things. So it's something you're gonna have to monitor kind of on a daily basis and seeing if you need to open the vents or close the vents or do what you need to do. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Ken. Let's see. Johnny had a follow-up about the uh, cucumber plants. Will too much direct sun and temperatures over 90 degrees kill cucumber plants? It really depends on the stage of their growth. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Really young tender plants maybe, but, you know, if you think about a typical Illinois summer, yeah. um, yeah, I would say in general, if if there's an adequate moisture uh, available, then they should be should be fine in those type of temperatures, right? Okay, let's see. Sticking with the cucurbits, uh, Christine also asked, "Have you had success in growing zucchini up a support to save on space?" Either of you done any of that? Uh, growing it. I'm sorry, growing it up a what? Yeah, growing it up a support, so like a trellis, oh, a anything like that. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I the only thing I've used is kind of like a hog panel or a wire mm-hmm. wire mesh, you know, kind of thing that can crawl up a little bit. But um, just I, that's kind of happened inadvertently because it was up against a row of zucchini. Mm-hmm. Cheers. Um, so yeah, we yeah, that's something similar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the way I've seen it done too. Is they'll. So I've seen some just create almost like an archway tunnel that you can walk mm. under too, which is big, big hog panels or fencing and then grow it up, up on that. But yeah, they've got those tendrils. So and that seems to work pretty good. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Keep those questions coming. I think we've got one over on YouTube here too. A um, couple follow-up comments on the LED lights and also asking about um, any tips on vacuum seeders? They're trying to kind of automate um, some nursery planting with vacuum seeders and uh, trays and hoppers and such. So that is certainly more of a uh, higher level kind of commercial type uh, production. Have, have either of you ever used um, vacuum seeders at all? 
No, not at all in my case. Yeah, I'm, I'm a backyard veggie grower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, same, yeah. I know they're... I, I know what they are. I know how they can be used. You can buy the the templates for doing a vacuum seeder on a lot of different commercial sites. I I would recommend folks uh, look at that. There are some DIY vacuum seeders that you can build yourself. Uh, well, if that's whatever route you'd want to take. Uh, but but yeah, I I for myself, I'm not that talented all the time with power tools. So uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll pay for a little extra money if someone has already figured all those things out. Right. Yeah, I have a couple of flower farmers that I follow along with, and I've seen many of them use a, a vacuum seeder when they're doing big planties. And it definitely seems to speed up the process if you're doing a larger scale uh, planting. I think you also have to be aware of kind of what shape the seed is, what type of seed you're using to, and whether it's going to work or not. But yeah, sorry, we're not super helpful <laughs> on that one. So if we may be able to put you in contact with someone on our local foods team if you are looking for some, some more info. Awesome. Okay, excellent questions. Keep them coming. Let's chat before we get to these last couple of questions. Let's chat about timing because we've, we've touched on it a little bit and we've touched on kind of how to set everything up. But timing, of course, is a big part of it. And We'll get added to the chat box. We have an awesome um, infographic that we put out every year that kind of gives you that schedule of kind of when to start things from seed, what you should do as transplant. So we're going to get that added to the uh, chat box. But like I was saying before the call, I've got all my um, cut flower seeds laid out here. And basically all I'm doing is giving that seed packet uh, a read. So on the back of the seed packet, it's typically going to tell you when to plant. So these zinnias here, these are all different zinnias varieties. Um, it's going to tell me on uh, the back when I should start those. So it's going to say, sow into 72 cell flats four weeks before last frost. So what I'm going to do is figure out what kind of my average last frost date is for my area and then count back four weeks. And that's when I'm going to start those um, those zinnia seeds. So I'm going to start these probably mid-April, if I'm even going to start them. I might even direct see them. Um, but that's what's so nice about the seed pack is that it's going to help you figure out kind of what that other timing then. Because I also have some viola seeds here, some pansy seeds that tell me to start seven to nine weeks <laughs> before my planting date. So I need to get on. <laughs> I need to get those, uh, those going. But do you guys have any tips on kind of timing things, right, when it comes to planning for the year? Well, yeah, counting back from the frost-free date. So that's probably the, the most difficult thing is just mm -hmm. where where in your part of the state, when, when is it safe, you know? Um, and I believe our guide is kind of divided by sections of the state. Mm -hmm. So you should be able to kind of tailor it to your section where usually we just kind of look at northern, central, and southern Illinois. I don't think we really differentiate, but you can actually go in and look at county records to the county level. Um, mm -hmm. The State Water Survey has all that data posted. Um, so you can you can dial it in a little bit more in your location, but um, gosh, it's always just, I don't know how many times I have messed up though, that calculation of when I start the seed inside compared to when it goes outside. And I used to really tend to be that early, early starter. And it, mm -hmm. a friend of mine in Southern Illinois had a greenhouse, really awesome little greenhouse in his backyard. And it's like by June, he had tomato plants ready to flower. You know, but on, or, I mean, you know, early, actually early May, he had tomato plants were <laughs> almost ready to flower in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that's kind of, that's kind of why when I, you know, back in the day when I started ever starting seeds inside, I was always kind of doing that. Nowadays, I'm tending to wait till late, much, much mm -hmm. later because there's, mm -hmm. I've been burned too many times by stuff that goes out early. And then I've got everything from five gallon buckets to floating row cover to old carpets and things. And I'm trying to get out there to cover things with the frost. So I just, I guess that's maybe my word of advice is as I've gotten more experience over the years, I've tended to not push the envelope earlier because it just is such a disaster when, when you do yeah. get that weird out of sync frost. But mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm would, the same way. I would say, do as I say, not as I do. I'm always behind. And so, <laughs> um, you know, I, I'll put tomatoes out in July or something. But um, it, yeah, uh, it, it is for me difficult. So the 
guides that uh, Extension provides, they are really helpful. Um, I would say the best thing that works for me is I use those guides, I read the seed packet, and I put something on my calendar. And it's like, mm-hmm. all right, on Wednesday, I am going to be seeding, you know, yeah. two flats of lettuce. Uh, and then in two weeks from then, maybe I'll switch up to some warm season stuff. You know, so I'm, I'm, I'm planning things out and I have to get it down on a calendar or else I just, I forget about it. You know, you go outside, right. you're having fun in the garden um, and you forget to have even more fun. You got to start some seeds. Yeah, that's a good point. Put it on the calendar. That's what I need to do too. <laughs> awesome. Okay, we've got some more questions that have come in. Let's see what else we've got. Let's see, Christine had a follow-up. How about a source for a hog panel? Um, any like farm store should have uh, something you could use or even some of the home, more like home renovation stores would may not be a hog panel, but they'll have some type of usually metal fencing material that you could you hog could panel, use. cattle panel. That's a little taller, yeah. obviously. Cows mm-hmm. are taller. Yeah, uh, it all works about the same. I've I've even used just um if it's not super tall, like like a hog panel is really stiff, you know. So yeah. you you can make a really tall arch out of it and it st- holds its form where if you're looking for something shorter, like we talked about um zucchini earlier just some uh, metal fencing out of a roll that you can bend can make Mm -hmm. that same arch or, you know, you can set it straight. So um, I mentioned hog panels and I guess I had a bunch because I was lucky to find, you know, somebody had some in the old back of a field that I, if I cut down some of the trees and moved the brush away, I could take those. Um, But I think there's, I don't know that that needs to be your end all solution. There's lots of other things that work. Yep, you just need something, and it could even be string, creating kind of a net f- network yeah. with string on bamboo, and there's a lot of, they just need something for those tendrils to, to climb on and up and over. Awesome. Okay, let's see. Question, favorite veggies to grow in pots? We have a huge walnut tree, so can't put a lot in the ground directly, or follow up, what does work in the dirt with the walnut tree nearby. So two questions, favorite veggies for growing in containers and maybe what veggies could go in the ground if they do have a walnut tree. Well, like favorite veggies for containers, I guess we, we've we grown just about lot, lots and lots of things in containers. And it was for us, it was just a way to kind of get our kids interested. Like they had a little more attention on their own pot than a whole garden. You know, mm-hmm. so we used to let our kids just kind of pick whatever they wanted. And out of, over the years, like that's made such a hodgepodge that I guess the biggest mistake I've made is probably kind of cramming too many things into the kids' pots, you know? So Mm -hmm. there, there's definitely some good estimates. Extension has a website that talks about container gardening with vegetables, but there's, but check out at least some numbers for the size pot versus the, Mm -hmm. you know, mature size of the plant. Um, But yeah, just like tomatoes and peppers have done really well for us. Um, You know, we've done some herbs in pots, Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to yeah. thinking of like cilantro, something like that. That's oh, kind yeah. of not a perennial herb that you'd start basil. We've done a bunch of, um, I love Chris. I love your idea of, um, the grow bags and, and sweet potatoes. We, we've done, we've done potatoes before. Mm-hmm. And, and the thinking behind that is that the grow bag, you can just dump out at the end, mm-hmm. which is kind of a cool way that has been fun to harvest or easier to harvest. So that's a, that's one to definitely try. I recommend that. Um, like we've covered a little bit, um, it's just a smaller mass of soil there, and it's going to dry out. It's, it's above the ground. It's not insulated with the rest of the ground. So if you haven't grown in containers much, that's the biggest shock, or at least it was for me, of like, gosh, I, I could water that tomato plant twice a day, it seems like, on a hot, hot summer day, and still have it dry by the time I went to bed, it seemed like. So, um, yeah, so that's maybe the biggest caution. But what have you guys liked out of, out of containers well, I've, yeah, I've like, really, in, oh, go ahead, Candace. No, go ahead, Chris. Go ahead. Well, I'll just echo your herbs, uh, Ryan. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love growing uh, any type of, anything I can cook with in a container that I can easily hop out the door and, and take a snip of. I'd say patio gardening is on the rise in terms of being trendy. Um, so you can look probably at seed catalogs, seed companies, and look for names like patio or munchkin or dwarf uh, certain plants that yeah. are good for that uh, yeah. even blueberries they're making like patio blueberries at yeah. yeah so look out for that 
Uh, I have grown tomatoes in pots, and I'll just say, make sure you choose determinate tomatoes and not indeterminate because <laughs> the determinate ones are a bit more shrubby and contained. The indeterminates, yeah. they will go nuts. So. Keep going. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. That's a really good yeah. point on tomatoes. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm the same way. Herbs is my main kind of, I would say, container crop. I've done uh, leafy greens before really successfully. Mm. I've done um, carrots. I actually like in a, if you have a taller container because then you can have really nice loose soil and you get a pretty nice looking um, carrot or other root crops. But yeah, there's a lot you can do really. Yeah. Any, yeah really. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say a really fun one that's really quick is just radishes. You know, we've yeah. done those with kids. That they, just they, and you're, you're think, talking about carrots, maybe think of that. It's just so loose. You get a nice, it seems like a pretty decent radish, and it just happens fast. It keeps a, a kid's attention long enough. Yeah. yeah. I, I'd say if you ever have a container gardening show, call me back. And I got a bunch, last year we did a bunch of edible containers where we use radish, beets, kale, uh, different leaf lettuces. We did... Uh, different varieties of thyme. Like you can go so nice. far into the woods with this topic here. So you better nice. rate us in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> nice. And uh, Alita, your follow-up question about the the walnut. Uh, what I would do is actually just do a quick Google search of walnut trees, vegetables, and add extension to it. There's a whole bunch of charts out there that'll tell you, or a list of plants that are affected by juggalone which is the the substance it puts out um i don't know off the top of my head i know solanaceous is probably the most affected but i couldn't tell you probably off the top of my head what would not be affected so but you know outside of vegetable gardening gardening native plants mm -hmm. a lot of those have a coevolutionary history with walnut and are are tolerant so True. in a, in a gardening or landscaping type setting that's kind of what my usual recommendation is it's something native yeah that's a good plant yeah, it doesn't always have to be veggies, right? Could be flowers too. <laughs> uh, okay, we got another question from Darren. Uh, cucumber beetles, we talked about those, have been brought up a few times and they kill many of my plants in that family, zucchini, cantaloupe, et cetera. Um, I typically use seven. Any other good tips for minimizing the pests? So cucumber beetle avoidance, Give those tips again. Uh, the biggest thing, uh, Ryan mentioned the uh, exclusion. So you could do some type of insect netting to keep them off early on in the season. Once those plants start flowering, though, you do need to get that off there so you can get some fruit. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, mentioned uh, seven, I think, I don't remember the new active ingredient seven. It used carbaryl. Now it's something different, like mm -hmm. lambda something. Um, uh, other, uh, making sure you're reading those those labels closely and that one thing, if you want either seven, which is a synthetic product, or you're using something else, which might be organic, treat it in the evening sometimes can be very useful because it gives you a longer residual because UV light breaks down pesticides, whether it's inorganic or organic. So uh, timing is also important, uh, not only for that, but also to minimize exposure to, to pollinators, which is something because these are pollinator dependent, we have to be very, very careful. So do yeah. that and scout, scout every day if you can. You know, a good strategy with the exposure too is kind of like a succession planting if you have the space and everything where, you know, you're you're maybe pulling back the insect netting as, you know, each couple of weeks and exposing new plants, you know, to kind of, again, just keep them separated from the beetles for as long as possible. But Yeah. And one more thing to throw in there, my colleague, Ken Johnson, he wrote a kind of in-depth article on cucumber uh, pests, including cucumber beetle, you can find that on the Good Growing blog. Uh, just you would do a search for Good Growing Illinois Extension cucumbers. Perfect, awesome, cool. Hopefully that helps. We've got a couple minutes left, folks. If you have any final questions, add them to the chat. I don't know about you guys. I am sure excited to get some seed started now and just do some gardening stuff, even though it's a uh, white out conditions outside mm -hmm. my window. But yeah, man, this conversation about vegetable gardening and getting started has definitely got me hopeful for things to come. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Oh, yeah. Right, Chris, I love your uh, thing about calendar reminders and that, you know, just mm -hmm. kind of getting that written down or, or even if you're not going to start seeds, just thinking about like, where did I have tomatoes last year? And what am I going to rotate into that bed? And like kind of, just starting to think about all that is kind of fun this time of year. 
mm-hmm. drawn out the garden little sketches. I kind of like doing that. Yeah, yeah, we didn't really, you know, we didn't really talk about that of of kind of succession and making sure you're moving groups of vegetables kind of throughout the garden. But you're right, I like to do that with my raised beds too. I'll just kind of map them all out and figure out what I where what I'm going to plant where, so I can figure out. Well, one, do I have enough seeds? Do I need more seeds? Most of the time, I have way too many seeds, and <laughs> I'm good. But yeah, it's nice to map it all out this time of year. I'm always shocked at how it's kind of hard to remember what things were last year. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, oh gosh, were the tomatoes there or there last year? That um, I've started to just, I mean, for, I, I've kind of had the shifting shapes of all my beds in the, the garden space we're in over the last five years because we moved, you know, in someone else's garden that's really fertile in a great spot, but we've kind of moved around the alignment every year, it seems like. So mm-hmm. that's made it difficult to then go back out and say like, what's my spacing need to be? How many plants do I need for this spot and all that kind of stuff. So I've just wound up having a little sheet in the garden with me that I'm drawing on. And then it's like at the end of our planting season, once everything's went in, I usually would write the dates. I just take a picture with my cell phone and then I've got it, you know, saved in my cell phone's picture history. And I can go back and look at that this time of year, see, Mm -hmm. see all that or, you know, so I don't know. I, I I used to just really not take any records or keep track of much as a vegetable gardener. And it's just, I've had so many conundrums come up. Like now it's like, although I'm not as meticulous as some people's gardening journal type activities, like I've got these kind of just, you know, makeshift ways that I keep track at least that, that helps this time of year then when you're starting to plan. But I keep my receipts. That's, that's my oh, that's key good. is keep the receipts. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, try to keep the plant tags, but those usually get tossed at the end of the season anyway. So uh, we, yeah. we moved to our new house. Uh, Full Sun is a moving target here. We actually grew our first year in a community garden and that satiated me for that. <laughs> but now, you know, we're figuring out things in our own yard and, you know, plant selection is key, disease resistance, uh, making sure you get your light conditions correct. Uh, for us, we grow three types of tomatoes. We grow a canning, we grow like a little cherry and a slicer. And like last year, we only had three tomato plants, one of each. So yeah, uh, keep space it will tell you what to do. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. We've got a couple of final questions that came in. So let's go ahead and do these quick. Um, Vicki asked, do sunflower seeds that are started in the house transplant well to outside? Uh, Vicki, in my experience, I've had the best luck just direct seeding my sunflowers, specifically the ones I'm growing for cut flowers, uh, you can start them inside, but they're so quick germinating, kind of like zinnias and the others, that I would do it pretty close to the time, uh, pretty close to that frost date. If you just wanted to get that little bit of head start. Um, but yeah, I've had the best luck direct seeding. Do you guys have any advice there? I'd agree. Yeah, okay. same, same here. I've always just direct seeded. Nice. Okay, let's see. John had a comment. Uh, about the cucumber beetles, so you commented you can delay planting to avoid the insect at their high um, high periods. That's a, that's definitely you talked about kind of succession and timing. Awesome. And then let's see, Lita asked when starting indoors with lights, how long do you leave your lights on per day? Excellent question. We didn't touch on that. Chris, how long do you leave yours on in the basement? Uh, um, well, I started uh, with the 12 hour day cycle and that's not long enough. So yeah. 16 to 18 hours. Um, yeah. it, sometimes it hurts the electric bill, but you know, <laughs> got to do what you got to do for your garden. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's me too. About, I would say probably 16 to 18, put it on a good old fashioned Christmas timer <laughs> that goes yep. on and off every day and you're good. Um, okay, and then let's see, Darren asked uh, about that cucumber beetle article you mentioned, Chris. We'll try to find that link and um, get it in the, the chat. So I think we got them all. So thank big thanks, everybody, for the awesome questions today. Like I said, it's got me excited to garden, that's for sure. So we will be back next month on March 17th. And our topic is going to be garden myths. So that's always a fun conversation. And we've got a special guest, Jennifer Schultz Nelson, will be uh, joining us, one of our former Extension friends and a garden blogger. So excited about that. And don't forget, too, to check out our horticulture um, Facebook group. We've had that in the chat box as well. So if you do have questions that come up um, in between shows, that's a great place to post pictures and ask questions and chat with other gardeners. So Chris... 
Thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much. This is always a blast. Thank you. Good, good, good. So thanks everybody for joining us. We will see you next month and happy gardening. Hope you can start thinking about getting some seeds going. Thanks everybody. See ya. See ya.